Uh, good evening. Um, thank you for the very kind invitation to return here to speak to you, and thank you to everyone for coming along this evening. I found that previous talk fascinating, and Brexit is not a heart attack, but it will need some regenerative... I can't even say the word. Regenerative economics, never mind regenerative medicine. Uh, this evening, I'm going to talk about clean Brexit and how to make a success of leaving the European Union. Um, I'm going to focus first on economics itself, which is slightly detached in some respects from the main part of how to make a success of economics, but given people's research focus, I thought I would look first at the economics profession and how I think it's coped with the Brexit debate so far. And then I'm going to focus on three areas. To make a success of Brexit, the UK needs to get three things right. We need to position ourselves in the changing and growing global economy. We need to focus on our future relationship with the European Union. And then third, we need to focus on the domestic economy. So global, regional, domestic. Um, so far, in the 22 months or so since the referendum, we've largely focused on the middle of those, the future relationship with the EU. But it's important to get all three right, global, regional, and domestic. And in the book, Clean Brexit, that I co-wrote with Liam Hannigan, we focus on the topic, basically, what would you have to do, regardless of how you voted in the referendum, to get it right? And we outlined areas that we need to focus on in all of those aspects, global, regional, and domestic. But let's begin and focus on the fact that we have elections all the time. Elections come and go. People often vote based on habit. Um, often, how people vote doesn't really affect the outcome because about 500 of our 650-odd constituencies are pretty safe. But when it comes to a referendum, as we saw two years ago, it really forces people to think. And indeed, my three children, who were then 24, uh, 22, and 18, told me that in the three or four months before that referendum, they and their friends spoke about little else but the referendum. I thought the referendum was a refreshing break from the traditional focus on politics in the UK, and indeed, in many respects, it's led to a significant shift since in terms of more people getting involved. People vote for all sorts of reasons, but the referendum outcome and the detailed analysis afterwards show that three factors figured. First, sovereignty. Second, migration. And third, the economy, of which spending on the NHS, etc., figured, of course. I will focus on all of those this evening. But first, on economics, given that I'm speaking to a number of researchers. Economics is not a science, it's a social science. And it hasn't come well out of the referendum, and I don't think it did very well in the global financial crisis that occurred 10 years ago. Why did it not come well out of the referendum? Well, Project FEAR, or the government's focus ahead of the referendum itself, was heavily based on its economic analysis. We were told by the UK Treasury that if there was a vote to leave, never mind leaving the European Union, but if there was a vote to leave, unemployment would rise by 500,000 over the first two years, and in a worst-case scenario, unemployment would rise by 800,000. In actual fact, in the two years since, we've seen employment go up by 550,000. We were also told that there would be an emergency budget it would be needed because the economy would be in the deep recession. It hasn't happened. Now, it should be said that immediately after the referendum, from June 2016 to the following February, there was a pickup in inflation. What I found quite interesting was that inflation picked up everywhere in the Western world, but we focused on it solely in the UK. The economy has done well. Some people have tried to attribute that to the better global economic picture. Yet the global economic picture genuinely only started to turn around last autumn. So the economy has shown a lot of resilience despite the referendum. But we should not have been surprised by that. In fact, the European Commission's own research and also analysis by the OECD had shown that the UK economy was, out of the Western economies, the one most likely to be able to cope with shocks. It was the most resilient, open, flexible. Therefore, the economy has a lot more strength than we imagine. I often think that Britain's biggest export is its pessimism. We tend to always think that things will go wrong. 
But I'll come to later the fact that the economy does have some deep-rooted problems. But why was it that economics was so badly caught out? Some of my fellow economists have talked about the politicization of the subject. And they argue post-referendum as pre, well as pre-referendum, there was aspects of that. Um, I tend not to go down that route. I think the challenge with economics is twofold. One, there is a lot of group think in the subject. Uh, Roger Butu writes in The Telegraph each week has focused on this. There's a bias towards the consensus, and that's often reflected in economic forecasting itself. There's also a second aspect that's very evident, and that's a status quo bias. The cost of change is always given high prominence. For instance, leaving the EU is, in my view, an economic shock. It raises, in the near term, the cost of trading with the rest of the EU. And also, if you focus solely on the trade aspect, the argument is it will be longer and harder to do trade deals with other countries to replicate or substitute for an easy trading relationship with the EU. So I think there is a status quo bias as well as a groupthink that dominates the subject. On top of that, the world economy is changing in phenomenal ways. Indeed, it's noticeable that in recent years, the biggest recruiters of ec economists have been tech and micro um, companies. That is, they're not looking at macroeconomists who look at the world top down. They're looking at people who know their industry and looking at the world bottom up. But also, the world economy itself is changing in significant ways. And that leads on to the first part, the global focus. Now, in the referendum, I wasn't part of the official referendum campaign, but I took the view that, look, every debate has pros and cons. This debate was no different to any other. In my view, the sovereignty argument dominated, but when it came to economic arguments, I thought the economic case for leaving was greater than that for staying. That being said, when you've been in something for over four decades, and when your economy has basically become geared to remaining in that thing, the European Union, we should regard leaving as a shock. It forces companies who have predicated their business model on being in the EU to actually adapt and change. For any economy, the outlook depends on the interaction between economic fundamentals, policy, and confidence. All are important. In economics, though, confidence is very difficult to predict. When people have low confidence, those people with the ability to spend and those companies with the ability to invest tend to refrain from doing so. That's why I argued that even though leaving the EU was good in the longer term, in the near term, I thought there would be an economic shock, and I called it a Nike swoosh. In fact, I thought the economy would grow 1.5% to 2% each year over the last couple of years, and I thought a weaker pound, which was inevitable, given that it was heavily overvalued, would be good news. Unfortunately, the pound is now appreciating, but notwithstanding that. A Nike swoosh in the sense that confidence will be hit until we remove some of the near-term uncertainty. But when we look at the global picture, regardless of whether we had left the EU or indeed have stayed in, we still need to reposition or would have still needed to reposition the UK economy in a changing and growing global economy. I'm on the advisory board of Open Europe, which is a neutral organization, but was very much campaigning for reform of the EU in recent years. The challenge is that the EU has been very reluctant to reform. It was slow to reform the common agricultural policy. And for an economy like the UK, which is 85% services, the EU has been very reluctant and slow to reform the single market, which does not work properly in services. We in the UK tend to view the European Union largely through an economic and financial lens. I would argue that the other 27 countries largely view it through a political lens. Therefore, to use an analogy I used in the campaign, I tend to think that Britain being in the European Union is like walking the wrong way on an escalator. It's walking the wrong way politically because for the euro to survive, the countries in the euro area need to move to closer political union. That's an economic argument that many people would agree with. But at the same time, the world economy is changing in a dramatic way. Globalization, technical change, innovation should be opening our horizons and should be very favorable to a service sector economy like the UK, 
In contrast, the European Union, I have felt, has become centralizing, controlling, and regulating. The challenge, of course, is how Britain needs to reposition itself in the global economy. We are probably on the verge of a period of sustained, strong global growth. And indeed, another challenge for economics is that it tends to always be far too pessimistic. Even in recent years, the world economy, if we take the view, hasn't grown particularly strongly. Last year, according to the IMF, it grew at 3.6%. This year, it's grown at 3.9%. If we take last year's rate of growth of 3.6%, the world economy would double in size in 20 years, and average income per head globally would go up by two-thirds. If the world economy grows at 3.9 to 4%, average income per heads globally go up by closer to 80% over a 20-year period. The world economy is growing in a substantially different way, though, to how it used to grow. Even the European Commission acknowledges that 90% of global growth is set to come from outside the European Union in the next 20 to 25 years. Indeed, the further ahead one projects, you could argue that that figure could be even higher. Since the beginning of this century, the world economy has grown despite the financial crisis and despite lots of challenges. It's very difficult to picture a trillion, but at the beginning of this century, the world economy was $32 trillion in size. The evening the financial crisis started 10 years ago, the world economy was $62 trillion in size. At the end of last year, it was $79 trillion in size. We are in the early stages of a fourth industrial revolution. Stem cell research, robotics, artificial intelligence, fintech, clean tech. All of this suggests that we should be actually changing our perceptions and focusing very much on how the UK becomes a more innovation, infrastructure, investment-led economy. The demographics are also fascinating. As Chancellor Merkel pointed out maybe six or seven years ago, the EU has the 725-50 problem. 7% of the world's population, 25% of its economic growth at that time, punching above its weight, but 50% of its benefit spending. The problem, she said, was that the European Union welfare, economic, social model needed to change. I think it's more than that. We need to see the European Union address some of the key challenges. Take demographics. Um, on the positive side, you could say one in 12 people in the world is an Indian under 27. Huge markets for countries like Britain to sell into. But take Africa. Currently, the number of people in Africa alive under the age of 16 is about 485 million. So Africa's working age population is going to go up by twice that of India and China combined over the next 16 years. Europe should have a migration policy. It should have a policy to address that. It should be a case of investing more in countries that do not have the ability to grow to sustain their populations. But it doesn't. It ignores it. So therefore, we need to see Europe facing up to some of these global challenges. But there are some issues that the UK, in its post-Brexit environment, needs to basically address it from a global perspective. One is universities. Now, Two countries dominate the global university schedule, America and the UK. In the Times Top 100, 12 of the top 100 universities are British. In the AQS survey, 14 of the top 100 are British. Many universities were negative about Brexit. Now, their concern was really twofold, if you look at the specifics, funding and the ability to attract staff. Those are, both of those issues need to be addressed head on. On the positive side, the government and the opposition as well, for that matter, have committed to the UK remaining in these global research structures. Look, 44 countries are part of the EU science budget, a third of those outside the European Union. There are other areas in which we need to interact with the EU. At the same time is the ability to attract still staff. Now, last week's Windrush debacle um, highlighted many different issues, in particular the fact that we need to have addressed or should have addressed the citizens' rights issue sooner and better. In the book Clean Brexit, we were very critical of the way in which the government 
didn't actually grant EU citizens immediate rights. But um, we are where we are, shall we say. But on the university side, it's very much about holding up to the commitments that the government has made, both on science and other budgets, and in terms of attracting skilled staff. One of the other big issues from a global perspective, and probably the biggest myth in the campaign, I thought, was that young people would be those most likely to suffer from leaving the EU. Um, that, I don't think, would bear up under scrutiny. Your younger people, it was said, voted remain either, or for a whole host of reasons, I imagine, but included within them were the ability to travel and the ability to work. Now, we actually do have data on where British people leave to go and work. The 2012 comprehensive Home Office report, even though it was from the Home Office, I'm sure it was good, um, talked about emigration from the UK. If people leave the UK to retire, they go to the European Union. If people leave the UK to work, they usually go elsewhere. And that's true for all ages, including young people. When young people leave, they're like older people. Five of the eight, top eight countries they go to seek jobs in are not within the European Union. They tend to be in the US Anglo-Saxon world, shall we say. That might change in the future as Asia becomes a big growth dynamic. But at the same time, you have to say that there should be more empathy, in my opinion, between young people here and young people, particularly across parts of southern and eastern Europe. One in two young people in Greece is unemployed. In fact, this morning, the data was fascinating on Greece. Greece has now repaid more money on interest payments than it received in initial debt relief from the EU. Incredible. One in four young people in Spain are unemployed. The EU has failed to actually provide jobs for young people on the scale needed. It's little surprise, therefore, that extremist parties are on the rise across the bulk of the European Union. So I would argue that democratic accountability, a global approach, and what many young people want would be better aligned with the UK under a Brexit scenario. But the last point on this global picture is about how the UK positions itself. Now, I think it's important to stress that there are near-term challenges. I don't think the UK has managed to um, articulate the global approach enough, and recent events last week I don't think will have helped. I'm on the border Bank of China, go out to Asia regularly, and the English press and BBC, the Financial Times, tend to be very critical of Brexit, and they are seen as very important guides to how the UK is performing. Therefore, the government, I don't think, has done enough to get across its global message, and that will make it doubly hard in the very near term. But when you step back, the UK is the fifth or sixth biggest economy, depending on currency movements. On the economic side, it's a member of all the key clubs, the IMF, the World Bank, the OECD. It's a key member of the G7 as well as G20. From the perspective of the financial sector, is a key member of the Financial Stability Board that coordinates and influences global financial policy. We will regain our seat at the WTO that dominates global trade negotiations, although it probably faces problems with President Trump in the near term, rather than being one of 28. We're a central member of NATO. In fact, the UK is half of EU defense spending. The other 27 countries do not match the UK. In fact, France and the UK are the two dominant countries. There are a whole host of other areas, but basically the key point is that the UK plays a very important global role. In fact, we are the only one of the 28 EU countries that meets its two global commitments. That is to spend 2% of GDP on defence and 0.7% on overseas development assistance. So to conclude the first part on the global picture, there are many worries about universities, about young people, about Britain's position in the world globally post-Brexit. Hopefully the comments I've made will address or has addressed those. But I think it's much more important than that to recognise how the world economy is changing in dramatic ways and we need to focus a lot more on the global economy and the fact that there are huge opportunities ahead. And in my view, we are better able to position ourselves to benefit from those outside the EU and in the future. But the second part is probably where the nitty-gritty is about our bilateral or regional relationship with the EU.
What are the options ahead for the government? You could say they come down to three. One is to reverse Brexit. Another is to have a soft Brexit. You could say it's hard versus soft. I would tend to use clean versus messy, but let's compromise and say it's soft and clean. So reverse Brexit, have a soft Brexit, or have a clean break. Obviously, just as in economics, there are trade-offs. In politics, there are compromises. So we'll probably have somewhere in between the hard and the soft, but that remains to be seen. But one thing to bear in mind is that it's hard to leave something when the other side dominates the whole of the process, as is the case in the Article 50, which is why um, Lord Owen's initial comments that we shouldn't have triggered Article 50 should have at that time been explored more. He was arguing we should have left the, via the Versailles Treaty, which governs international treaties. That being said, again, we are where we are. Should we reverse Brexit? In my view, no. In fact, I tend to say that the best speeches on Brexit have been made by Labour politicians. The best ever, I thought, was by Hugh Gateskill in 1962 to the Labour Party conference. Also, Peter Shaw, Brian Gould, Tony Benn, all in the mid-70s, ahead or around the time of the first referendum. Their focus was solely or largely on the whole sovereignty issue. The fact that British people should be able to force politicians to act on the behalf of British people. And their argument was that once you go into, as it was then, the European Economic Community or the EU, you basically become more detached from that democratic process. In the referendum, we were told it was a once-in-a-generation decision. Imagine if the vote had gone the other way. Can you imagine a desire to change it? I doubt it. But more particularly, at a time when we have autocratic leaders globally, Xi Jinping, China, Putin, Erdogan in Turkey, it would seem strange to want to reverse a democratic decision in the UK. Also, as I mentioned, we have extremist parties on the rise within the EU. While we couldn't reform the EU, I think leaving the UK could be a win-win, both for the UK and the EU, if both start to position themselves properly. I think it's very difficult to actually see how we could reverse the process. And basically, having another referendum, I think, would be more acrimonious than the first. But it's vital that Parliament holds the executive to account. There's this bizarre situation where some levers, if we can call it that, seem to not like the fact that Parliament holds the executive to account. The thing I find strange, though, is the difference between the reality and the rhetoric. The House of Commons voted in June 2015 by 554 votes to 53 to delegate to the people to have the referendum. It couldn't, you cannot imagine a more comprehensive vote in recent parliamentary history. They, you might say they decided to give the people uh, the decision, partly because it made it easier for them. But even after the referendum, Parliament has debated this on a number of times. It voted 494 to 122 to trigger Article 50, or in favour of Article 50. After the election, there was also a big debate about whether the UK should stay in the single market and the customs union. Again, Parliament voted not to, by 322 to 101. So every time Parliament has voted on this, they have decided, A, to give the British people the right to decide, they upheld Article 50, and they've upheld not being in the single market and customs union. So therefore, it would be quite bizarre if later this year, Parliament decides to vote against the government. But given how the government is behaving, that's always possible. Um, Basically, both houses of parliament will vote later this year. But last week in the debate, Lord Hill, um, who was uh, David Cameron's, one of his advisors, I thought he had a good quote. We must surely place a greater priority on being able to shape our own future than on preserving the status quo. And that comes on to the key issue. I don't think there's been enough focus since the referendum on events in the European Union itself. And those events in the European Union itself should, in my view, 
make us feel reassured that we have made the right decision. President Macron has not pulled his punches. He has highlighted recently, and indeed last week he used the phrase civil war when he spoke, I think it was in Strasbourg, to the European Parliament, or was it Brussels, I'm not sure, but nonetheless he used those words. He basically has articulated that either the European Union fragments into different layers, a core and the periphery, or it marches on to closer political union. The reality is that if the UK were to decide to re-enter, we would be aligning ourselves in the EU to either be in the periphery, or we would be aligning ourselves to an EU whose future direction of travel points to us being in the core of closer political union or in the periphery on the outside. I don't think that is necessarily a good place to be. But economically, the biggest challenge with the EU is the politicians keep driving the process. Look, when I was arguing with Open Europe for reform of the EU, there was a number of countries who were saying the same thing. The Visegrad countries in Eastern Europe, Sweden, Portugal, and I do think Prime Minister Cameron missed a huge opportunity. He could have gone in at those renegotiations with a top-down approach and basically argued as the Dutch were calling for, for red cards and yellow cards, assigning more power back to national parliaments. Cameron didn't do that. He went for a very micro UK focused. He asked for very little. He got very little in return. And in those referend in that debate, or sorry, when the negotiation of Prime Minister Cameron, we should remember that the key thing they asked for, Cameron and Osborne, was to make sure that the non-Euro countries, the countries who were not in the Euro, would have independence from the countries who were in the Euro. The French and the Germans said no. Basically, the survival of the Euro was central to the project. And the challenge is the Euro is the most stupid economic idea ever thought up by anyone, anywhere, anytime. It is fundamentally flawed and rotten to the core. That's why the challenge is the only way to keep the Euro together is closer political union. Spain is not like a Germany. Greece is not like a Germany. This is why you're seeing extremist parties on the rise across Europe. But if the Euro and the French have highlighted the outcome, the logical outcome, you have a, hard, a fast and a slow lane or you go to greater political union. That's the challenge, and that's the challenge that has to be faced up to in Northern Europe as well as Southern Europe. But beneath the surface, things are not particularly good. So what should we do? Well, the UK needs to actually be sensible. It needs to think about what's in the long-term best interest of the UK as well as in the short-term best interest of the UK. The single market. I think there's now widespread agreement in Parliament on both sides, or all sides, I should say, that we should be outside the single market. Well, maybe I should say better on both sides. Um, other parties, Liberals, etc., SNP might think differently. Look, the single market should work in theory. It didn't work in practice. But if you are to return sovereignty lawmaking to Parliament, you have to be outside the single market. It empowers Parliament. If you want to control your migration policy, you have to be outside the single market. The Labour Party has also pointed out that the right of establishment of multinational companies to base themselves in Luxembourg, Netherlands, or Ireland basically denies the UK a huge tax base, and I think they're completely right. The economic argument, though, leads some people to debate things on both sides. Only 8% of UK companies sell directly into the single market. 92% do not. The challenge is those 92% have to abide by all the rules and regulations of the single market. So that's why those people who are keen about leaving argue that the UK should be seeking a regulatory dividend by distancing itself from the regulations of the EU. The companies, though, who sell into the single market are big companies. They account for 12% of the UK economy. They naturally favour the status quo, and they naturally want us to remain in it. But if you look at the size of the EU28, as a group, they were 34.1% of the world economy in 1980. Now they're 22%. After we've left, they will be less than 20%. Important, but shrinking. The UK's exports to the EU are also declining. 
61% of our exports went to the EU in 2000. 2016, it was 44%. Last year, went up to about 47 and a bit percent. But the trend is down, um, and I think that trend will go down in the future. So the single market is, by being outside, it gives the UK government the ability to set its migration policy, and it empowers Parliament. There is a trade-off economically for those companies whose business model are is predicated on selling into the EU, but for the bulk of small and medium-sized firms, being outside is actually better. Then we have the customs union. This is where the debate is. Look, the customs union is a tariff wall, and it's about setting trade deals with the rest of the world. The best way to think about it is that when the EU was set up, it was set up with a tariff wall to protect French farmers and German car makers. That's why the tariffs on goods coming into the UK are highest on food, clothing, and footwear. Three items disproportionately high in poor people's budgets. Then the next highest item is autos, 9.6%. Tariffs globally are coming down because of globalization, but non-tariff barriers are important. That's why the British have continued to push for reform of the EU in terms of the single market to help the service sector. Being outside the customs union allows the UK, if it wants, to set its own tariff deals, uh, tariff rates. It could cut them to zero. Uh, it should cut them to zero in all areas where there is not any domestic UK industry. But the other aspect is the trade deals. And I'm amazed at how many people have become experts on trade in the last two years. Look, the UK has continued to complain, even when we were in the EU, about our inability to influence trade deals with the EU. We were one of 28 countries. Services always figured low. And the area that the EU always gold-plated was agriculture, which is why it hasn't done trade deals with many of the big emerging economies. Several much smaller economies than the UK, such as Chile, Singapore, South Korea, with far less diplomatic and commercial influence, have signed a range of free trade agreements dwarfing the size of those struck by the EU in terms of size and scope. But one should not underestimate the challenge once you leave any of these things. In economics, a lot of focus has been on what's called gravity models. This, these basically tell you that you trade more with large economies nearby. However, there has been a lot of debate in the economics world in the last two years about gravity models. Uh, Ryan Bourne, the very well-known economist in the States, has talked about gravity models being backward-looking and may simply not be well-suited to analysis large long-term regime change. Professor Graham Gudgeon here at the University of Cambridge has done research both with other academics here in Cambridge as well as in Ulster. And as he pointed out, the Treasury, quote, the Treasury do admit that the data is troublesome, the data underpinning their gravity models. And it's obvious that these results can be applied uh, cannot be applied, rather, to a well-developed open economy like the UK. In fact, Open Europe has looked at gravity models based on likely growth rates of economies in the future. India's economy is going to more than double over the next 10 years. Germany's will grow by 14%. Even if you apply gravity models to those future changes, it starts to change the dynamic of the argument to the UK looking globally to do its own trade deals. The big issue, though, is Northern Ireland. And what should we make of that? Well, um, I personally think that it's not the legalistic problem in terms of the border that it's made out to be. But the argument is interesting. Um, the head of the HMRC, the tax authority, um, John Thompson, has testified now, I think, seven or eight times to different parliamentary committees and on each occasion, he said that there can be no border, sorry, there can be a border crossing Northern Ireland without any hard border. He points out that at the moment, you have different tax rates on the north and south of Ireland. You have people working in both economies who live in the other economy. And you also need to monitor illegal movements. And that is all done with a soft border, not with any hard border. Also, there's car registration, vehicle recognition, apparently at all the major border crossings. The EU itself, European Commission, under Lars Carlsson, has talked about how a smart border can be applied easily in places like Northern Ireland. 
The Canada-US border has 370 million people on either side. The Northern Ireland Republic border has 6.5 million people. Also, the World Bank Logistics Performance Index tells you that 95 to 99% of goods traded between the developed countries avoid any form of physical inspection. And in fact, Ireland conducts the lowest level of physical inspection currently in the world. That being said, we should not, again, overlook the challenges. Currently, about 5,000 firms in the north of Ireland trade with the south of Ireland. 80% um, of the trade, most of those are smaller than 10 people, 80% of the trade is local. So it's basically agricultural goods, etc. So there is two-way flow, and one shouldn't over uh, ignore it. But one needs to keep it in context. Also, the Northern Ireland economy, as the Institute of Economic Affairs pointed out last week, is 82% dependent on the public sector. It's a very different economy to that elsewhere. But the data suggests that a soft border is a practical solution. But the question is whether the politics wants that to be the case. The other issue that I think we need to focus on is the city. But I'm going to just leave it to the Q&A, but just to say that most of the evidence since the referendum suggests that London will remain the financial centre of Europe. It's recognised in the city that most of the attributes of the city are Brexit-proof. Rule of law, English law, the language, the time zone, alongside the skills, knowledge and infrastructure. We shouldn't forget that when we didn't join the Euro, we were told that London then could lose out to Frankfurt, Paris or Amsterdam as Europe's major financial centre. In the latest global rankings of financial centres, Amsterdam was 50th. Paris, I think, was 26th. Uh, Frankfurt in the teens. Our big challenge is with New York, Singapore and Hong Kong. That being said, if regulators want to do so and fragment the market, then some businesses will have to move staff to other centres in Europe but we need to keep that scale in perspective. So to conclude the second part on the bilateral relationship, there are areas that we still need to address, but I think in terms of the single market, there's agreement we should leave, and in terms of the customs union, it's about the ability to cut your own trade deals as well as set your own tariff rates. The third area is the domestic economy, which has not really been focused on enough. The UK economy is an incredibly imbalanced economy. This was highlighted at the time of the global financial crisis and very little has been done since. Being in the European Union, in my personal opinion, has been absolutely bad news for the UK economy over the last 40 years in addressing a lot of these domestic issues. Now, it should be stressed that there's lots of things the UK could have done when it was in the European Union, that it did not do. Now we have left or are about to leave, we have to do them, and we can't blame Brussels if we don't. At the same time, there are lots of things that we will now have the ability to do once we've left. Before the referendum, a few years before, the previous coalition government produced a whole series of competency reports. I read most of them. They are eye-opening really eye-opening, and not enough people read them. Indeed, Rohan Silver, who was one of Cameron's advisors, wrote a very good piece in the Sunday Times about four weeks ago, saying, and he was a Remain supporter. He said, at one of the budgets a few years ago, when the UK wanted to give tax cuts to small firms, they found that they were not allowed to do that because of certain competency constraints under the EU. The very fact it's so difficult to leave the EU and the fact that we are still worried about it highlights the fact that it has infiltrated so many different parts of not only our social structure, but of our economy. So therefore, again, no one should underestimate the challenges. But the imbalanced nature of the economy, in my view, is highlighted by the size of the financial sector relative to other parts of the economy, by the twin deficits that we have on the current account and the budget deficit, by regional imbalances. Earlier this year, the European Commission produced a once every three year analysis of the 263 regions of the European Union. Three of the top five are in the south of England. London, Buckinghamshire, Bedfordshire and Oxfordshire, and Surrey and Sussex. Four of the top 10 are in the south of England. 
But the UK has the most heterogeneous selection of areas, partly because some of them perform very badly. Northern Ireland, West Vales and the Valleys, Cornwall and the Scilly Isles, and also South Yorkshire. We have a big imbalance regionally between London and the rest, between urban and rural, and between urban and suburban areas. Half of global growth at the moment comes from the top 600 cities in the world. 157 of them are in the West. In 25 years' time, forecasters who focus on urban dynamics predict that the top 600 cities will then account for over two-thirds of global growth. But then, only 20 are expected to be in the West, from 157 now. Smart cities with clean energy, new technology, and broadband are growing up. The UK needs to really start addressing the challenge globally as well as at home. In addition to those imbalances, I would say that we have an imbalance between skilled and unskilled, old and young, property owners and rentiers, high earners and low incomes, and those who have won from globalizations and those who have lost. What should we do? Well, in terms of the EU debate, the migration policy needs to be addressed. And it's worth spending some time just digesting some of the figures. We have had the biggest ever increase in population in the last 15 years. Professor Bob Rothorn of King's College, Cambridge, produced a paper for Civitas at the end of 2015, saying that Britain could meet its economic needs by having migration in the tens of thousands. In the 1950s, we had less than 10,000 people per year net migration. In the 60s and 70s, it was outflows. In the 80s, we had 7,500 per year. From 1990 to 1999, after freedom of movement came in, we had an average net inflow of 62,500. In 2004, we had the Big Bang, the accession eight countries from Eastern Europe. Germany decided, as did another EU countries, not to allow any in. The UK didn't. This is where the Home Office didn't do itself any favours. In 2004, before that, they had produced the survey saying that there would be a relatively small flow of five to 13,000 per year up to 2010. Four years later, in 2008, the House of Lords reported that 765,000 had been the net migration inflow over those three years. In fact, for the last 13 years, the UK has had net migration flows equivalent to a city the size of Newcastle, 252,000. The challenge is you can have that migration inflow fine, but you need to be spending the money on your social infrastructure and on your housing structure. As Bob Rotham pointed out in that Civitas paper, you can't let flows in and decide to ignore the consequences. So the UK needs a migration policy. Some people say it should be a migration policy that only allows skilled workers in. Others would say that's a discriminatory policy and we should allow a mix of unskilled workers in. I think it's a debate that we need to be mature enough and have. We have a choice of three routes, a points-based system. Now, Gordon Brown, when he was prime minister, had a points-based system for non-EU migrants. And in February 2008, it's four tiers, he decided that unskilled non-EU people were not allowed in. The trouble about a points-based system, Australia, Canada have it, they're trying to increase the size of their population. Um, maybe not necessarily the best for the UK. You could then have a worker permit system, which is identifying a job before you allow someone in. Or you could have what Labour Party favours in private, which is a devolved immigration policy, where you have certain regions of the UK have their own immigration policy. Certainly we need to discuss it, but at the same time I think we need to recognise that we actually need to have low migration does not mean mo no migration, but we need to actually have a policy that's linked in to our domestic economic agenda. And that domestic economic agenda, I think, should be the five I's. I could actually even call it the five, six I's. Investment. For the last 40 years, UK companies have invested little relative to GDP. In the last 20 years, as a report from the Centre for Social Justice last year showed, there has been a collapse in investment on training staff. 
a collapse. You cannot believe how little investment UK companies spend on their staff. And it's a reflection of the fact that why should you? You can attract skilled workers, skilled, cheap workers. Therefore, you need to address that investment issue. Infrastructure. The UK's infrastructure is all based on cost-benefit analysis from the Treasury, which is why London gets a disproportionate amount. If you look at spending, infrastructure spending per person, government spending per person, Northern Ireland first, obvious reasons, that was even before the DUP, Scotland second, London third. Southeast of England, East England, and East Midlands come bottom of the list. Infrastructure spending needs to be scaled up, and it needs to be funded by attracting the long-term savings of pension funds. Canadian and Australian pension funds invest in our infrastructure because their rules allow them to do so. Ours are far too short term. UK funds are incentivized to buy government bonds and banks are incentivized to lend to the property market. Innovation. Uh, the UK does really well on this. Cornell University ranks top in, in innovation countries, but it's a bit of a, I don't think it's a great measure, it's more an input. When you look at outputs, the real challenge is the Indo-Pacific region. America, India, Northeast Asia, really investing very heavily. Now, China and South Korea have more robots per head of population, but their populations are aging. The UK does not do well on robotic investment, partly because we have cheap labor. It's simple. If you make labor scarcer, you have to start investing more. But innovation is about using our output from universities and commercializing it, particularly on the innovation space. We then need to have inclusive growth. And inclusive growth means more people sharing in success. And I think that needs to be linked in as much to a regional policy. At the moment, we almost have net migration of young people under the age of 30 to Bristol and London. They tend to migrate to those two cities, leaving most other cities. And the final I is the incentives. Regardless of your political persuasion, or regardless of your economic thinking, the one thing that does work in economics is incentivizing people. Let me conclude. I've tried to, I'm sure I've said things that not everyone agrees with. I might have surprised myself and said things that everyone agrees with. But the last 22 months, I don't think have gone particularly well. I think this is partly the complexity of leaving something that we've been in for over 40 years. But also, I think we have lacked a vision from the very top. We need to have a vision that brings the country with us, and we need to have a vision that explains to the rest of the world how the UK is positioning itself. Last Friday, or in Thursday, Friday, in The Spectator, they talked about the wrong type of Brexit, how it's inclusive, inward-looking, not outward-looking. The reality is it's not just leaving the EU, as I've always said, it's what you do once you leave. And we need to get the global picture, the regional picture, and the domestic picture right. Lord Salisbury last year said we should remember that the first Brexit took a long time. And I wondered what he meant by the first Brexit. He said it was when we left Europe on religious grounds. And that lasted from 1536 to 1588, until the Armada was finally beaten. But... Um, he wasn't being facetious. He was explaining that we are dividing or splitting from Europe. But I did wonder what historians might make if they looked back at Brexit now, um, in the future. At a time of big data and innovation and change, maybe the historical con context is important. If you look back economically over the last 200 years, four years stand out for the UK economy, in my opinion. 1846 the repeal of the Corn Laws. Many would say was the most important economic development in British history in the last 200 years after the first Industrial Revolution. It was when the establishment and the landowners were beaten by Prime Minister Peel, Richard Cobden MP, and the Anti-Corn Law League. Basically, it changed the balance of power away from the lobbyists and the producers to the people. And the biggest lobbyist area in the world at the moment, I would argue, is Brussels. But it's about leaving and freeing up the consumer and the people. Second great year was 1931, when we left the gold standard. Then Britain set its own domestic economic policy, 
And while the 30s were a poor decade for the USA, the UK did relatively well in the 30s. 1945, the creation of the modern welfare state, and indeed you could argue it now needs to become even more modern. And 1979, the supply-side revolution that took a number of years to basically implement. But the point is that when you have change, it takes time and it's difficult. And not everyone wants to embrace change because the losers tend to be more worried than the potential winners. The winners take some time to emerge. But whenever you have change, it's important that you articulate the route, the journey, the vision. And I would argue that if we actually focus on the global, the regional, and the domestic agenda, then despite the difficulty, sorry, difficulty of leaving the European Union, I think ultimately it will be one of the positive years to be added to those four of 1846, 31, 45, and 79. Maybe if we do it right, we can add 2019. Thank you for your time. Well, Dr. Lyons, thank you. That was a, a model of structure and clarity and fascinating numbers. Um, don't know whether anybody has any questions. It's a, not a very contentious subject after all. Um, but uh, maybe if people would try and catch my, as usual, I'll call the people I like the look of uh, and try and get uh, my lovely assistant, oh, sorry, um, to uh, go in the right place at the right time. There's a gentleman with a beard halfway up on the left-hand side. Thank you. Do, do you just want to do individual questions or group Yep, group individual questions. questions to start with. Okay, yes, um, yeah, two, two points. One is um, vision. Yeah. I, I think you've hit the nail on that. I, I look at the uh, front benches of our political parties and think, you know, I, I was very anti-Brexit, but I'm terrified of what these guys, are the mess they're going to make of it. I just don't see the skills in our front benches to actually drive it, be it left or right. Uh, who, who, would you, who would you hope could do a good job of it? Uh, and the second thing is to do with um, <clears throat> automation, artificial intelligence. I think that will be a very big impact to us, and we don't know how that will impact us once we leave the European Union. It might be better that we were tackling that as a collective rather than individually, and I wonder what you think Thank about you. that. Great. Thank you. Actually, uh, my answer to both questions can be interlinked in some respects because there's another institutional change that I think is very important. Um, I, I tend to believe that Westminster is very vertical. It was highlighted, let me give you an example. A couple of years ago when uh, Gordon Brown was Prime Minister, he was about to make a visit to China. And I was asked to go to an event at the Foreign Office. It was in the map room. And there were three outside speakers, Martin Moore from the FT, it was Breslin from Warwick University, myself, to talk to people in Whitehall because Gordon Brown wanted to have a strategic approach to UK policy towards China. And the room was packed solid. And I said to the person organising the event, Gosh, why is it standing room only? He said, well, um, this is the first time we've had one of these meetings on China, and we invited all the people in Whitehall who worked in China, and this is the first time most of us have met, and we were surprised that so many people are working on China. And that's basically vertical integration, not working across. And I think, coming back to your question, I think if we start to have big agenda items... These are the big issues that we need to focus on. Then we can start working across government. I was saying very few countries do this. Singapore does it well. China does it very well. So it's, in some respects, to get the answer to the first question, leadership, is about, I think we need to be asking the right questions and setting the right institutional structure to come up with the right answers. But on technology, I'm working on a report for two think tanks, Centre for Social Justice with the Joseph Roundtree Foundation on the future work. And it's fascinating. I, I'd say it's the four Cs. Continuous change, complex change, competitive aspect of technology, it costs job, but there's a big complementary aspect, and that's where we need to be focusing on. And for the big business groups, apart from the CBI, when you speak to them, they tell you Brexit is not the most important issue. Technology, robotics, artificial intelligence is. So I think we need to get the right framework in place. But coming to your first question, I wouldn't necessarily say it's about personalities, but... Um, I think part of the challenge also we shouldn't... Let's be fair to whoever's in power or to the people in power. When you have a minority government, it makes it very difficult anyway. Uh, naturally, it's for the opposition to hold the government to account. But I would like to see 
everyone move to work in the best interest of the UK. I tend to think once we've decided to leave and then people can't reverse the process, then it should force everyone to work together for the country's best interest. But in terms of leadership, uh, without going into the personalities, I don't think the current leader we have has enough of a global vision and doesn't understand the global picture enough. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mike Bell. Firstly, would, would you take over in number 10, please, because I agree with nearly everything you said. Um, but uh, my question... Don't, uh, don't go any further. <laughs> <laughs> the question is, uh, is a different one. At the beginning, you, you uh, talked about the problems with economics in terms of their predictions for the economy. And certainly, I was amazed that, uh, if you like, we, we just have the same ding-dong debate between two sets of experts again and again. And I've been interested in this failure of economics for some time. And it seems to, to, that there are two possibilities. One is that economy, economics focuses on entirely the wrong thing. It focuses on money and money flows and interest rates and tariff barriers, whereas it should be focusing on innovation and getting products to market, uh, which is something you touched on. The other possibility <laughs> is that um, economics is based on an equilibrium model rather than um, an evolutionary uh, model. I wondered if yeah, uh, thanks for the question. Things are things Mike. that you um, yeah, on. I, I think you've touched on some key points. Um, partly p due to the financial crisis as well as Brexit, you've got some good economists. If you think in the UK, some of the economists I most respect, uh, thankfully they were also Brexit supporters, have done some very good work on this. Um, Paul Ormrod in particular, who's looked at other disciplines, physics, etc., and how you can bring disequilibrium and um, extremes in. Part of the challenge is that, look, we're here in Cambridge. The economic model that John Maynard Keynes set back in the 30s, Y equals C plus I plus G plus X minus M, still sets the template. We haven't moved on enough. The global financial crisis also highlighted that we didn't understand credit and money supply. No. I, I, the Bank of England has a quarterly inflation report. I wrote a piece in The Telegraph a couple of months ago that in the last two they hadn't mentioned the word money in their inflation report, uh, which is key to the financial system and to inflation in some respect. So I think the template we use it needs to change. With big data, what you're finding, as maybe I touched on at the very beginning, is there's a greater demand for um, economists who look at particular sectors and particularly regulatory environments, and that is coming more to the fore. But I think um, we need to understand how the world economy works, and you're right, um, it's not always... Uh, and we don't always return to the mean, and equilibrium is not always where we return to. Also, I think we need to spend a lot more on data to gather the data. Even though we have a time of greater data generation, we don't always have enough timely data on some of the key economic variables that we need to have. But I, ag I agree with what you've touched on, and it's an area of the subject that we need to focus on even more. Thank you. I'm not sure if that covered all the points. A gentleman down here. Uh, yes, you, sir. Are there any lessons we can learn from Singapore? Yeah. Um, yes. Um, are there any lessons? Not that I'm going to keep trying to flog books, but I wrote in Constellations of Economics about why we should be positive. I quite like the Singapore model. I have to admit, I used to go to Singapore all the time, and it it was always the most boring place to go to. So, um, so it was always better to visit than to be based in there. And if you're there, you don't get a chance to vote. And democracy, uh, people do value democracy. But the lesson I would ask in answer to your question is about the interaction between the public and the private sector. And the ability to actually um, learn from mistakes or to change decisions if you're getting them wrong. Part of the challenge is that Certainly in the EU, there's a ratcheting effect. It's very difficult to reverse things. You could argue sometimes that's the case in the UK as well, but it should be easier to do if you're a, a small economy or an independent economy. But from the Singapore, strategic thinking, um, getting the incentives right, and the interaction between the public and private sector. I'll give you one example. When I worked at Standard Charter, I remember one client, they um, were re moving one of their regional headquarters to Singapore, and the number two from the organization came in for a meeting. I said, why are you doing that? He said, Singapore guaranteed us the tax rate we're going to pay for the next 30 years. They guaranteed the tax rate, and the company believed them. So if you have long-term stability 
that helps as well. Uh, gentlemen, yes, and then, and after that, to your left. Yeah. Well, we, we really have to thank the speaker for giving such a brave speech in Cambridge, in spite of which he seems to have found the only man I've met in Cambridge, and I'm here all the time, who actually seems to be pro-Brexit. If I was to look for a difficulty, I think there are two issues in which the speaker sort of practically fallen into the moat that divides politics and economics. <laughs> but let us just take two of them quickly. I think change is one of the vital issues. The British economy has needed change since the middle of the last century. It's finding very, change very difficult. And my own view is that without Brexit, it isn't going to change and it will continue to sink under a suffocating EU administration. I think the second problem is that uh, the major economies in Europe, like Italy, France, and to a lesser extent Spain, but including Greece, are all unable to change because of political constraints. They are just coming up to the problems of adjustment, which don't look less soluble. So I think you might have given more interest to the counterfactual, namely what might happen if Britain stays in the EU. And none of the economic analysis has considered the desperate instability that's coming up very quickly in the EU. The EU currency arrangement is a complete disaster. Economists well, know that. Let's yeah. ask our speaker to respond to that. Well, you yeah. probably got the point. Okay. Thank um, you. Well, I tried to touch on that. I mentioned Macron and the euro. Yeah, um, the EU is a political project, and um, that's the, the reality of the situation. Um, this was brought home to me very much a few years ago when I had the pleasure of debating with Varoufakis, the Greek finance minister, and he gave you the most critical analysis of the EU and then he st stayed in the euro. And I asked him, why didn't he leave the euro? And he said, well, the Germans wouldn't let us. And, but it's this, uh, the political constraint is a big one. Now, that's why the only way I would argue the EU can survive, or the euro can survive, is by having a binding political unit. Now, if you're, David Owen, I think, gave one of the most articulate speeches on Europe here in Cambridge before the referendum when he talked about why he was pro-Europe but anti the EU. And I think the challenge is the political constraining nature of it. And the euro system is, is a pro-cyclical one. In the good times, the money goes from the core to the periphery because the periphery is seen as a high-rewarding um, sure fire bet because there's no currency change. So hence, the money went to Spain, to Ireland, to Portugal and led to property booms. There, and in Greece as well. In the bad times, or the difficult times, the money goes back to the core, leaves the periphery, and their economies adjust. If you don't have the ability to change your currency, and I'm not saying that currency change is always the right answer, you can either change your currency a price, or you have to change the quantity. And if your price, the currency, is not allowed to change, then wages need to fall, you need to have higher unemployment. And that's the big challenge. Now, Europe needs, the EU needs to reform. Without Britain in it, you could argue you could see a reform of the EU. But it really does depend on what the Germans want at the end of the day. So I do think, in the debate here in the UK, I do not think we've focused enough since the referendum on the global picture. And I don't think we focused, going back to your question, on the challenges that the EU, and in particular the Eurozone itself, faces. Yeah, the question, the gentleman said that we know the Germans aren't going to uh, agree to transfer payments. What that means is the northern European countries funding the southern European countries. If they do do that, then they would expect to have greater influence over those southern European countries. And that's the challenge. And indeed, it comes into President Trump's criticism, his economic advisor, Navarro, that the Germans, he has said, 
or they've said, or they might not have used Germany explicitly, but they've implied, they has benefited from a cheap euro. I, the argument is that the a Deutsche Mark, if it had existed, would be much stronger. Germany has one of the biggest current account surpluses in the world, which means it should be spending more. But when you go to Germany, they, as I was saying at the dinner beforehand, their argument is why should the good guys become like the bad guys? So it's about compromise at the end of the day. Thank you. Jane, gentlemen, two, day, we, as well. two rows behind you. Yep. I see this, the clock's turning around, so if there are any uh, people who want to get in, you better catch mine in the next few minutes. Please. Okay. I'll be bearing very quick then with the answers, sorry. Bearing in mind that Germany and France are the biggest players in Europe, uh, who would win the, the economics or politics over if we call, call bluff of Europe and decided that a zero tariff border was required, but yeah, um, assumed. I think um, good economics is always be uh, leads to good politics. I think economics wins out. You see, the UK leaving the EU, we, we could cut tariffs to zero. For, say, for instance, German cars come to the UK with zero tariffs at the moment. If we leave, we can decide to cut all tariffs to zero. Um, so the German cars were coming at the same price, but that would suddenly make American and Korean cars 9.6% cheaper. Or you could decide you want to keep tariffs at 9.6%, and then German cars become less competitive versus American cars and Korean cars. But the argument of those people who argue for free trade is that you might as well cut tariffs to zero because tariffs are a tax. And in America, when uh, Trump has argued for higher tariffs, the American public has said, are you kidding? Um, higher tariffs are a tax we would pay. So tariffs are a tax paid by UK consumers. The challenge, of course, is tariffs, as I say, they're coming down, but they are incredibly high on food, clothing, and footwear. They really are ridiculously high. Um, and these are three areas that poorer people pay more of their income in. So coming back to your question, France and Germany, I think they will have to work out the relationship between them. You see, I don't think we should be anti-EU. I just think the politics of it suggests that we should be doing something different. And good luck to the EU. Clearly, they're a big trading partner. We should want them to succeed in the future. But I personally think, despite the challenges of leaving, we would do better outside. Thank you. Gentlemen, uh, there and uh, then uh, that gentleman, yes. And then uh, perhaps we'll take the two questions together. In fact, three questions together. There, the gentleman with the red top and then the gentleman with the blue top. Could we ha have your three questions and we'll bundle them together? Yes. I would like to know if you would think that the, Un the United States would be better off if they scrapped their monetary union. That is to say, if they scrapped the dollar and had different currencies for different states. <laughs> Getting away from a continual theory to some of... Sorry, you're going to answer that. No, no, Karen, we'll do uh, getting questions. away from the general theories to some of the realities that affect us here in this food producing scheme. There are growers who are currently employing over a thousand Europeans to harvest our vegetables, etc. We've already lost the uh, vegetable, a the, uh, the medicine agency to uh, Germany. Poland is going to grab a lot of our crop testing uh, work and uh, it seems to be, you know, a lot of talk and not much action. And the third question, and I'll ask you to answer all of them, sir, with a blue top. Barnier was uh, reported in the papers as saying that the EU had rejected May's plan for uh, the borderless, um, hard borderless free uh, in, in Ireland and had said it subjected it to forensic analysis and found it to be completely unworkable. Where do we go from here? Okay. Thank you. Right, the three questions. Um, first, should the US scrap the dollar? Well, I don't think it will. Uh, should it? No. Well, the reality is that if you have a currency union like the States, there's then you need to have a political union. They do. And you need to have complete labour mobility. Um, their relationship between the federal government and the states 
is a bit more complex than it used to be in the sense that the states are not always bailed out. But if you compare, the argument, this argument was always used about when Britain was joining the euro or the, sorry, deciding whether to join the euro, the fact that a currency union, history shows that currency unions only survive or currency unions of large nations only survive if they become a political union. And that's been the case even using Scotland, England currency union. You have political union and you have complete labour mobility. Um, I don't think the Americans will change. Second question, yeah, we've lost a few things. Yeah, no one should expect um, leaving the EU means that everything is going to stay in the UK. Um, in terms of seasonal workers, I think we need to have a migration policy that suits our economy, and if we need to have seasonal workers from the EU, then we should let seasonal workers from the EU come in. But you're right, we need to be addressing some of those near-term challenges. I, no one should argue that leaving means everything is a win or everything is a loss. Uh, and there are challenges with leaving, which is why I called it a Nike swoosh in the sense it adds to uncertainty. But despite that, it's about getting the incentives right and getting the structure of the economy right. Um, and some people put a higher um, negative, shall we say, on some of the things you've suggested than I would put a positive on some of the other things. But I accept that. The third question about Barnier. Yeah, the... Um, gentlemen, the, what the UK government had proposed for Ireland, I thought was an absolutely stupid idea, uh, but I think lots of people did. They called it a hybrid approach. It was innovative. The government said it was innovative, it was untested, and it would take five years. But basically, the proposal, uh, it was the most complicated thing. In fact, um, when the experts from tax and um, customs areas were asked about this in one of the select committees, I think it was the Brexit committee, they were scathing about it. So I thought, I th I thought it, last week, I thought it was good when the EU said that. But my challenge would be that the EU was saying, um, well, it, it all seemed a bit uh, concerted last week, a whole series of events. What should we do? Basically, you need to be practical. We should not go for a legalistic structure. Uh, at the moment, as I tried to touch on, you have a soft border between the north and south of Ireland. You have tax rates are different both sides of the border. People work in the labour market both sides of the border. And there's monitoring of illegal migrants um, from the UK and the Irish authorities. They manage to handle all of that with the soft border. And apparently on the major border crossings, there's vehicle recognition. People who argue about the soft border of the future, it's Lars Carlison who's talked about the soft border. He's produced a major research paper for the European Commission. Also, one looks at the um, Swiss... Um, French border. Apparently it's a bit longer in size and it's, you can cross the two of them. The tariff costs, I think the Swiss said last week, were turn out, they're the equivalent of 0.01%. If you translated Swiss tariff, or the costs of firms, sorry, the costs of firms having to um, apply all the things they need to for crossing the French-Swiss border. If you applied those to the Irish north-south border, I think it works out at 0.01% of the GDP, so pretty small. What you need to have is pre-registration and therefore registration of goods that go across. I debated this with Simon Coveney and, someone, uh, um, and Pascal Lamy last November in Ireland. Well, I, I didn't debate it, I was quite flexible. I just said, we'll work it out sort of thing. But what they were saying was 80% of the border flow is pretty local. So you need to just be flex. The argument is to make it work, you need to just be flexible and you interpret it as you would Norway, Sweden, France, Switzerland to suit the local circumstances. For all I know, you might still need to have some physical structures in place. Uh, but some people who know far more about this than I do suggest that you can be far more flexible and make it work. I think it's like most of these things. If you want to make something work, you can find ways of making it work. If you want to find the legalistic hurdle to stop it working, you can do it. So I think it needs some political will. But by all accounts, the technical experts and the HMRC seem quite confident that you can make it work. Um, so we need to see how it's applied. So, but I'm not an expert in this. I just read what they all say. Uh, but I've been struck by um, how positive some people are about the options that are available. But coming back to your question, yeah, um, I thought that the um, customs partnership 
made no sense. Just basically, goods that were going to come into Northern Ireland and go on to the rest of the EU were still going to be applied tariffs. The UK was going to collect them. Other goods that stayed in the UK, tariffs were going to be rebated. It sounded like the most complex scenario possible. So anyway, but I think we'll probably have a more few, few more complex scenarios between now and November. Look, thank you for your time, and thank you for inviting me, and um, good luck in the rest of the evening and whatever else. Thank you. Thank you.